Thank you for joining us this morning, this afternoon, or this evening. This session of our two-day Data Privacy Day event is a Data Privacy Commissioner's Roundtable featuring some of the foremost experts from data protection authorities around the globe. My name is Tammy Dockin, Chief Data Privacy Officer for the World Bank. I will moderate this session and engage in a discussion with our featured speakers, as well as manage the questions we've received from our attendees ahead of time. We have with us here today, Commissioner Liu, Personal Data Protection Commission, Singapore, Commissioner Edwards, Office of the Privacy Commissioner in New Zealand, European Data Protection Supervisor, Mr. Vivarovsky, Commissioner Dixon, Data Protection Commissioner, Ireland. And to deliver closing remarks, we have Ms. Meg Kinnear, Secretary General at ICSID. We are also very honored to have Mr. Shaolin Yang, Managing Director and World Bank Group Chief Administrative Officer, MDCAO Shaolin. We are thrilled to have you here with us and the floor is yours. Thank you, Tammy. Greetings to everyone. Welcome to the World Bank Group State of Privacy Day, which is focusing on the pricing topic, the roles, responsibilities, and challenges of data protection authorities, especially in light of pandemic era. Our esteemed guests are among the foremost experts in data privacy. They represent some of the most sophisticated and pioneering authorities charged with complex roles, combining education, investigation, enforcement, and so much more. A new data protection legislation springs up everywhere. It demonstrates society's evolving relationship to personal data. What behaviors are acceptable across the globe? What are the prevailing attitudes on transparency and control? How can personal data privacy policies best be implemented? Here with us today, are some of the true pioneers in this evolving landscape. Data protection authorities, leaders in this space, who have much to share on these questions. Many more data protection authorities are set to find their footing over the next few years, including in developing countries. This is why fostering global cooperation and knowledge sharing so opportunities like today's event is so important. For us at the World Bank Group, we recognize and take seriously the ever more critical role that personal data privacy will play in development and for people in developing countries, in the public and the private sector, and in investments, knowledge, research, and data that is our daily work here. And so, as an institution, we have undertaken our own journey to hold ourselves to a higher standard of personal data privacy with a new po uh, privacy policy adopted in 2018, which is now in the beginning stages of implementation. Adopting this policy was an important step. It signals to our staff clients, shareholders, uh, stakeholders, and people around the world that their personal data is used in a trustworthy and responsible manner. And it signals that we leave our core value of respect for people we serve and the partners we work with. The journey to implement our policy has been no small feat for an international organization like ours with operations and staff in over 130 countries. Ensuring the protection of personal data, privacy of our clients, partners, and staff, as well as the people who count on the World Bank Group for data, knowledge, and research is an ongoing effort. We are fully engaged in to rethink and, uh, and to rewire internal controls 
norms and processes across all the regions of where we work. And we are listening to and working with our external and internal stakeholders in order to ensure this policy takes deep root in the way we do business. We are in the middle of that process. And in the spirit of knowledge sharing, I know many here today from our side will be offering insights on what we have learned and what we are still learning as we move closer to our goals. We are honored to have an esteemed panel with us today who also know well the value of privacy education. Prepare yourself to be excited and inspired by the insights they will share about the future of data protection worldwide. Take, it, uh, take this opportunity of having a constructive, open relationship with us, watch our work, and we are here to listen. Share your perspectives, ask us questions, let us hear from you. Before I hand, hand it over to Tammy Dawkin, the World Bank's first Chief Data Privacy Officer, I want to say once more, on behalf of the World Bank Group, welcome. It's a wonderful, so many of you are here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shaolin, for the kind and inspiring remarks and for opening this exciting chapter of our Data Privacy Day 2021 event. So let's dive right in. I will um, ask each of our panelists to begin with a two minute opening statement. I'll turn first to you, Commissioner Liu. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tammy. And it's a great pleasure to be here, I think alongside many of my distinguished colleagues from around the world. I'll perhaps just start with two perspectives. Uh, the first is the importance of data, I think in the past year, and if I may, the past couple of weeks, has really come to the fore and in many cases become front and center. And the question is why? And the reason is because data increasingly is driving the future of our economic growth going forward. And it's shaping what the digital economy is looking like and it's shaping what the digital society is looking like. Uh, as many would say, data is now that new capital. So as a government, I think it's important in our role as uh, regulators to provide a stable environment that has to try to find balance uh, between providing protection for consumers on one hand, yet at the same time enabling businesses to use that data to drive uh, economic innovation and growth. Obviously, it's quite clear that if you lean too much on one side, uh, consumers will lose confidence, and if you lean too much on the other side, then that will stifle innovation in the economy, and I think everyone's poorer for it. The second perspective is that this space obviously is uh, increasingly complex. It sounds a bit cliche, but I use the word complex and not complicated because complicated implies a certain mechanistic element to it. But complex means that the tensions that we face, all of us face here on a day-to-day -day basis, is not going to be static. The lines are going to keep shifting. There will be emergent, call the emergent properties as a result of these interactions. And these interactions cut across technology because the technology is changing so quickly. It cuts across our end users because in terms of what the end users are educated to do or not educated to know, that will drive a certain direction. Accountability of companies, how much we place the onus of companies to be accountable as far as data use is concerned. And last but not least, ourselves as the regulators in terms of our own capabilities and in terms of our own ability to keep up the latest trends, uh, be it in technology, uh, be it in the users, or be it in businesses. Uh, complex also because I, I would dare say that not most people may not fully grasp the full complexity of data. And I would say a lot of the public will probably be relatively confused by all the regulations. And I think it's during a period like this that all the more uh, they look to institutions and trusted institutions for support. And which is why I think today's theme is really on point, because I think institutions like ours uh, is really about maintaining that confidence. I mean, in many ways, we shouldn't look at ourselves as regulators. We're really trust stewards. And I think that's an important role to keep at the back of our minds 
And so just these two perspectives, the first, uh, importance of data is really becoming front and center and what's going to define what we do is how we track that balance. And I think secondly, because it's so complex, I think all the more we have to be cognizant of our role as the stewards of that trust. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner Liu. Commissioner Edwards. Thank you, Tammy, so much. Uh, and thank you to the World Bank for this invitation. Uh, it's it's a really important topic. A, a global vision for maintaining trust uh, is the crest of a, of a growing theme that we've seen going back also to the OECD, also back to Shinzo Abe's comments in 2019 with the G20, where he uh, articulated a vision for global data flows with trust. Uh, the World Bank itself in its digital dividends report in 2017, I think, recognize the importance of a common harmonized approach to uh, data protection regulation. There are enormous benefits from the technologies that we've seen uh, into the digital sphere in the last couple of decades, but we won't get the benefit from those unless people can conduct business online, can share information online in a trusted environment. And in an environment where data knows no borders, people must be able to have that trust not only in their own domestic sphere, but throughout all the uh, countries through which their personal information will be flowing. New Zealand was one of the first countries to have a universal data protection law, which covered both the public and private sector uh, in relation to all personal information in 1993. Uh, that fallen behind a little bit. And last year, we've had our first big refresh of that law. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. But it starts to get us to a convergence that sees the GDPR, that sees the Californian law, that sees developments across APEC and, uh, and uh, Africa and all parts of the world moving towards a common point. And I think this World Bank uh, conversation will be an important part of that movement. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Edwards. Um, Mr. Vigorovsky, may I now turn to you? Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me here. And thank you for this nice opportunity to, to be here together with the National Data Protection Supervisor from one of the European countries, uh, uh, Helen Dixon. So we somehow can present both uh, all European approach to the problems of privacy, but also the national ones. Uh, which of course may differ between the countries, uh, uh, but have to be harmonized inside one system which we have in the European Union. And at the same time to be open for the, all the cultures and all the legislative so solutions uh, that our friends on the global level have. So what we actually do is we try to realize the policy of data protection, but also to answer the uh, questions, complaints, uh, and uh, all the regrets uh, that the, the, the so-called data subject, which means uh, the human beings have, remembering that we are not defending the data and we are not securing the data. We are securing the human being. Uh, we have to remember that uh, we work for the, for the humankind. And in this sense, I think uh, Helen will say a lot about the practicalities of the approach uh, on the national level. I would rather try to say a few words about harmonizing the thing how to deal with the fact that we speak in many languages, that privacy means different things in different uh, cultures. Also inside Europe, you can find the, the countries which uh, are uh, very open, where the societies are very open with uh, sharing information about each other. And those uh, that have a long uh, history also of different kinds of surveillances which, we, which are applied. So the cooperation uh, is the most important word for us, uh, but at the same time, the understanding uh, that we all want to live in one world uh, where the uh, data is not an obstacle, but is helping us uh, to, to, uh, to uh, travel, but also to communicate with each other. Thank you, Supervisor Vigorovsky. Um, Commissioner Dixon, over to you. Thank you, Tammy, and thanks for the great opportunity uh, from the World Bank to join you all today. And of course, in particular, 
to have this opportunity to engage with my fellow panelists. I think everyone participating today, whether listening or participating on the panel, understands the significance of the protection of personal data and why it's important. For me, the Advocate General Bobic of the Court of Justice of the European Union put it very succinctly in an opinion he issued in 2017, when he said that there's no doubt that the protection of personal data is of primordial importance in the digital age. And I think we see particularly in the EU with the GDPR, that the GDPR has become embedded in the consciousness of the public, even if, as Commissioner Liu said, there's still some confusion about the application uh, of the law. So lots of positive things have flowed from the application of the GDPR in 2018. Uh, many thousands of complaints have been resolved by my office from individuals. Uh, we have commenced and concluded in some cases large scale investigations. Very importantly, thousands of new data protection officers have been appointed in organisations across the EU that are now providing that essential bridge between organisations and how they process personal data uh, and the public. But I think really that uh, we started to see some of the value added that uh, a strong framework law like the GDPR offers uh, in the last year when the global pandemic hit. So as we saw new challenges and implementations of personal data processing around manual test and trace systems, new COVID tracing apps that were proposed, vaccine databases planned, employer return to work protocols, lots of implementations with lots of sensitive personal data processed. We saw that the GDPR with its guardrails of data protection impact assessments, transparency and fairness, it facilitated approaches that engendered the trust of the public precisely at a time when trust and solidarity were needed. So uh, I think at the Irish DPC, we say long may that approach uh, and those new lessons of the GDPR continue. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'm struck by the, the concept of trust that is inherent in each of your, your opening remarks. That's something that resonates quite strongly at the bank. Um, turning now uh, to some questions, um, Commissioner Liu, uh, I'll start with you. In addition to being the Commissioner of Singapore's Personal Data Protection Commission, you also serve as the CEO of Infocom Media Development Authority. This provides you with more in-depth view of both the massive potential of technological innovation, as well as valuable downsides to its misuse. Could you speak a little bit about the intersection of your two worlds and what lessons from IMDA you bring to the PDPC and vice versa? No, thanks so much, Tammy. Um, so a little bit about the Infocom Media Development Authority in uh, Singapore. Uh, we view ourselves as the architects of Singapore's digital future. And uh, we have really two big uh, domains. One is in the infocom sector and the other one is in the media sector. And I think increasingly you can see the convergence between these two uh, big domains. And we look at it across the three slices. One is regulatory, the other one is economic promotion, and the last is of course social, because we want to make sure that we educate the less uh, vulnerable, the more needy, to ensure that there is a digital divide that forms. So the scope is uh, naturally a little bit wide, but I think one of the advantages, and it's one of those unique positions that we are in, that we're able to manage the different dualities, the duality between regulatory and economic promotion, between regulatory and society, and between economics and uh, society, to really try and find the best balance point. Uh, as you correctly pointed out, there, there are immense and massive opportunities, but at the same time, there are significant risks if we're not careful. So if I give just two sort of very, very uh, simple examples, the first one is a little bit more localized. So for example, in helping our small and medium enterprises digitalize, which is extremely critical, especially during the COVID period, where you got to go to uh, online platforms, uh, e-payment platforms, and many of it is simply for survival. And that was what a lot of what we were doing at IMDA. But at the same time, we infused that economic promotion with what we call a better data for business program, that while they are collecting customer data, we infuse it within that 
uh, this is the responsible, uh, practical way, and in a way in which you view data that's consistent with our Personal Data Protection Act. And on top of that, if you wanted to differentiate yourself, there is a data protection trust mark that allows the consumers to actually choose uh, companies that are more uh, data compliant and basically data aware. So that is one of those dualities between the economic hat and the promotion hat. And we see it as a valuable thing because companies, for example, don't see this as an externally imposed uh, externality or a constraint. They view it as an integral part of responsible use of data as far as the companies and businesses are concerned. So that's just sort of the first uh, simple example. Another more global example is that with our economic hat, uh, we are pushing forward with how to enable responsible data flows across borders. And we're going this through what we call digital economy agreements. Think of them as digital free trade agreements or digital FTAs. So obviously that's to facilitate economic growth. But at the same time, we're quite clear that we want to put in place uh, very clear legal safeguards in terms of, for example, model contractual clauses, which we have negotiated, for example, within the entire ASEAN bloc, or working within APEC, as far as APEC CDPR uh, mechanism, to ensure that there's a certain sort of common interoperability as far as data protection and data standards is concerned. So I think hopefully that gives you a, a very quick texture of uh, how we try and marry that duality, I think hopefully to find a good balance point. Uh, balance indeed, and I like that you are um, encouraging or organizations to find the value in using personal data appropriately. Um, uh, Commissioner Liu, in a similar vein, what are some of the choices you've had to make when balancing public health with the protection of personal data and economic stability? So I think that's a, that's a very important question. Uh, I think as we all know, COVID is still raging in many parts of the world. Uh, it's a challenging time, but the past year has been a challenging time for all countries. Uh, lives have been lost, and I think the fight still continues. Um, but I think one of the perhaps slightly understated achievements uh, that people are not aware of has been this. Uh, if you look at the arc of history, uh, previous, for example, influenza pandemics, it was always that the virus was moving faster than the data because the virus was spreading uh, before we actually even knew it. Whereas today, with a, a combination of both international collaboration where data is flowing, as well as digital tools themselves, we actually have a fighting chance where the data is actually ahead of the virus. So I think in allowing that data to be ahead of the virus, uh, we have placed a lot of efforts to contact tracing and how digital technologies such as contact tracing apps uh, can facilitate that. Uh, so on one hand, balancing a very pressing public health need but on the other hand, designing up front the safeguards, for example, uh, the data is actually not shared, it's stored in your local device uh, and only on an authorized uh, request that the user then transmits this data. The data is always encrypted and is only decrypted for use by certain very selected, cleared uh, public health officials. So I think through that fine balance, uh, I think we've been able to maintain a healthy level of trust in that contact tracing uh, regime. Uh, and of course, I don't think it's perfect. It continues to be something that we iterate and find a balance. But I'll just say it has allowed us to pretty much open the economy uh, close to normal. Uh, if I was walking around malls today, uh, other than the fact that everybody is wearing masks, the level of normalcy is, is close to normal. And I think that has been that balance. We have thankfully been able to strike. And I think we continue to need to watch that balance going forward. Great, thank you very much. Um, emphasis on balance there, um, noted. Um, let me turn now to Commissioner Edwards, Office of the Privacy Commissioner, New Zealand. Commissioner Edwards, 2020 was quite a year for New Zealand, wasn't it? Um, in addition to COVID and everything that came with it, as you mentioned, your updated Privacy Act came into effect not too long ago. Um, your office is known as one of the most communicative data protection authorities. To the extent I believe there was even a television ad for the updated Privacy Act. In light of that, with so much going on, I'm curious what your inbox looked like. And more broadly, based on incoming requests or clarifications or complaints, what do you feel people were most curious or concerned about? 
And then lastly, is there, do you see a divide between what citizens are asking you and what organizations are inquiring about? Yes, thanks, Tammy. We did have a big year last year. In addition to doing all of our normal business as usual, uh, we had to plan to bring into force a uh, new law which had new uh, obligations on businesses and, uh, and plan all the uh, communications and implementation of that. Uh, but then, of course, we had COVID, which dropped a whole lot of work on us that um, we never would have expected at the beginning of the year, all the pressures of contact tracing and delay. What we saw in terms of public demand for information was mostly around uh, the new obligations, such as mandatory breach notification rules, uh, which New Zealand uh, just enacted and came into force on the 1st of December. Those imply, uh, impose an obligation on industry to notify affected individuals and my office if there is a breach which could cause serious harm. And people can be prosecuted if they don't. So there was obviously a great deal of curiosity about uh, that threshold. How do we know if a breach is going to cause serious harm? Another element that caused uh, a lot of inquiries was uh, restrictions on transborder flows of information. For the first time, agencies are required to do due diligence if they are exporting data. And this is a similar kind of requirement that we see out of the GDPR, which is, um, you know, has had privacy shield and adequacy determinations and model contractual clauses. So New Zealand businesses, which are heavily dependent on international trade, are coming to terms with those. Uh, so those were the main ones. Um, but also perhaps of interest to this group was a new extraterritorial effect of the New Zealand law. So it will apply to any business that is carrying on business in New Zealand, whether or not they have a legal or physical presence in New Zealand. In terms of individuals, we didn't really see um, a huge rise in uh, inquiries of any different character. People will still want to know how to get access to their information, how to make complaints, uh, what restrictions there are. So the, so those were consistent, but industry really stepped up uh, and wanted to know how best to comply with the law. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. I, I'm hearing a lot of overtones of uh, the GDPR and the standardization, um, it would seem, into uh, other other regimes, including yours, that, that certainly goes a ways toward the um, the unification of our approaches to data privacy. When I think about privacy priorities here at the World Bank Group, um, a big one is making the material engaging for both staff and stakeholders. I don't want to say get people to care because I think they do care, but I'll say instead dispel some of the myths that make people feel they're powerless over their personal data. What has your experience been like engaging with different segments of society and what lessons can you share with us? Thank you. Um, what I've learned, uh, I've learned by getting things wrong. You know, people like you and me, Tim, we've spent many years involved in data protection and it is important, it's hugely important, but not everybody else has our same level of passion or engagement. So I think that if there's one thing I've learned, it's that you have to meet people where they are and provide messages that are relevant to them. If you want staff to take their own privacy seriously, you've got to present uh, the, the value proposition, if you like, to them. Not, not as a technical uh, lesson in the application of law, but what it means for me personally. Um, and, you know, my, my mission when I first started, uh, I said I wanted to make privacy easy, make it easy for organisations to comply with, make it easy for consumers to have good privacy choices and make it easy to get redress uh, when things went wrong. One of my favorite stories about communication and, and engagement in the way that you say is um, we, we had a problem with the ubiquity of drone technology. A lot of people were complaining to us. And of course, it's, it, it's not really within our jurisdiction because many of these devices were being used by people in their personal capacity, but it was generating a great deal of uh, anxiety. So we got together with the police and the Civil Aviation Authority and said, well, how do we insert ourselves into the supply chain and raise the standard of conduct around these devices? Uh, and there's a whole lot of law, the technical civil aviation laws, the privacy laws and things. But we produced a pamphlet that was to go with every single drone uh, and, and distributed those to retailers. 
And the first top line bullet point simply said, don't be creepy. And so that just really grabbed people's attention and, 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 and you know, said, um, uh, there's something to think about here. You don't need to worry about all the pages of civil aviation law. Just think about human conduct and behavior and what you would expect. <laughs> I love that, uh, Commissioner. Don't be creepy. Reminds me of uh, something I saw where it says, uh, creepy, creepier, or creepiest, which setting would you like? Um, uh, I love that approach, and I think you are um, spot on in your approach of making it accessible, understandable, catchy, um, and not just another list of uh, legalese that people are, are struggling with. Let me now turn to European Data Protection Supervisor, Mr. Vivarovsky. Supervisor Vivarovsky, since your days at the Article 29 Working Party, and perhaps even longer, you've watched privacy discourse and privacy legislation evolve at lightning speeds, both within the EU and worldwide. In your capacity as European Data Protection Supervisor, you sit perhaps at the largest nexus of privacy-concerned organizations, institutions, countries, and authorities in the world. Would you walk us through the process of coming to a consensus on any contentious data protection issues when you're taking into account dozens or hundreds of nuanced opinions, some of which may be diametrically opposed? And is there any one issue, perhaps individual rights of action or encryption or cross-border data transfers that exemplify this sort of spectrum of differing opinions? I think we may, we may discuss on any problem that, uh, or any issue that arises uh, in uh, data protection and in privacy protection as the field for this kind of cooperation between different authorities uh, and different, before, between different um, people, stakeholders. I, I don't like the word stakeholder, but actually uh, among different organizations and different representatives of the, uh, of the community. So, of course, sometimes you have the procedures and you just have to follow the procedures. That's the most important thing. But in most of the cases, you are in a kind of discussion that you have to map first and to plan first. If you don't plan, if you don't map all the people and all the organizations which are around, you are lost at the very beginning. Because normally, trying to answer any kind of question in the privacy world, you have to do it nationally, sometimes locally, because the, the situation in the country may differ from one region to the other. But you also have to do it on European level as for us, because we have the same GDPR, the same legal ground uh, for the actions. But also globally, I think nobody uh, else than, than Helen Dixon can tell us uh, how difficult it is to work with the small staff uh, on all this level at the same time. Well, I can say that uh, uh, the, uh, remembering that we are doing the things nationally, globally, and Europe, European-wide at the same time, we have to remember who are our allies, both in the institutions, but in the civic society as well, and in the business, in the industrial world as well, because we often have the same goals or we are going the same way to, to, the, to them. Uh, in practice, it means that uh, uh, trying to get the uh, all-European consensus, uh, we have to find the leaders, we have to find those who will be reporting, who will be preparing the solutions, who will be leading the whole discussion. Then, usually, as the European Data Protection Board, which is the follow-up of the work of the Working Party of Article 29 that we told about, uh, we work in the subgroups. So these are the specialists, the experts, uh, who are dealing with the with the subject, preparing it uh, for the final decision, and sometimes leaving the political discussion on some topics uh, or more ideological discussion to the uh, heads of the institutions, uh, who at the same time have to remember what are the points of views which have been declared from their countries. And then finally, we go to the plenary sessions of the European Data Protection Board, uh, trying to find the, the, the final answer. But this is not the end of the story. Then we start the consultation process. So we have the draft, which is presented to the market and to the uh, organizations and to individual people. And like it was with the current, uh, with the current uh, guidelines that we had on so-called supplementary measures in, uh, in cross-border transfer of data, we got 208 documents of consultation from different uh, entities uh, in order to take into consideration the point of view. 
And we have to do it remembering that, first of all, we have to be transparent, but we have to keep the confidentiality when it's necessary. We have to plan our actions ex officio, but remember that each and every complaint that comes to us uh, may start uh, the enforcement uh, procedure before we reach the point uh, when we really harmonize the approach, uh, the same approach in Tallinn and in Dublin, the same approach in La Valletta and in Lisbon. And remembering that Europe is also not European Union. This is also Switzerland. Uh, these are the countries uh, that are closer or far from the European uh, uh, principles. And for last but not least, or maybe even the first, we are in the global world. And we have to remember that those whom we are, wait, uh, we are uh, working for are all around the globe. Very interesting um, and very good tips there. Uh, let me ask you one more follow-up question. Um, the GDPR certainly serves as the North Star for, for inspiring emerging privacy legislation around the world. But that said, other privacy regimes are emerging to reflect different cultural values and attitudes toward personal data. California's CCPA and the associated amendments through Prop 24 is one recent example. Do you think there's space for a less centralized, more regional privacy framework? And what are the most important principles to keep in mind when doing business across different privacy regimes? I can say that we are very proud and happy of the influence that the General Data Protection Regulation has. But of course, we understand that there are different uh, legal regimes. Uh, there are different cultural backgrounds that we are coming from. And the things may differ from, from country to country, and even the principles somehow may differ. To some point, to, to some extent, uh, these are the things which are acceptable. But of course, uh, there are the points uh, where we have to say, yeah, we are differing. Uh, this country or this, uh, uh, this uh, jurisdiction is the one that is staying far outside of the principles uh, that uh, we want to defend. But of course, there is a re there is a way to, to cooperate on all Europe uh, all the uh, global level, and there are the principles that we share all of us. I think uh, Convention 108 of the Council of Europe uh, may serve as a kind of vocabulary for uh, uh, all the global uh, discussions. Uh, at the same time, remembering that uh, the cultures differ, you you really don't need to say to Europeans, we know that the cultures differ. We just uh, drive the car throughout Europe uh, and we find out uh, that Spain is not Sweden and Finland is not Greece uh, and Poland is not Ireland, although we are all Europeans and all from the same background. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I was picturing a, a, a tour through Europe as you were um, calling out those countries. Um, and uh, you also called out Convention 108 that served as um, a, a basis for the World Bank's uh, privacy policy. So very influential um, in that. Um, Commissioner Dixon, uh, the centrality of the Irish Data Protection Commission to global privacy discourse can't be overstated. Um, Ireland hosts the headquarters for large tech companies like Google and Facebook, and that puts your office on the front line of emerging data protection issues, and your investigative and enforcement efforts have ripple effects across the globe. But only a few short years ago, I understand your office had less than 30 staff. What sort of resources are necessary to facilitate the scale of disputes your office takes on and what sort of balancing test of priorities, if any, are you required to make in terms of resource allocation? Um, asking for a friend here. <laughs> Thanks, Tammy. Lots in that and your questions really are very pertinent and, and spot on to where it's at. Speaking again in an EU context and from the perspective of my office, we know that the GDPR governs all forms of data processing, every type of controller. And for example, my office alone, aside from the big tech companies you named, we supervise hundreds uh, of thousands of organisations. Then again, also at an EU level under the GDPR, the role that national DPAs have are broad. We issue guidance, we approve binding corporate rules, 
We handle thousands of individual complaints, thousands of breach notifications. We conduct those big investigations you mentioned of the large scale systemic issues. Wojciech talked earlier about the cooperation across the EU, which is labour intensive and important too. So with that kind of breadth of role and the volume issues, uh, you're very right that the question of resources looms large. But I actually think focusing on just the resources of the DPA, just as a comment, is too limited a perspective. Because just to say in two and a half years now of, of monitoring the application of the GDPR, it's our perspective, particularly when we engage with some of the newer DPOs in organisations, and engage around bigger implementations, public sector bodies and other controllers try to implement, we can often see that there isn't a, a maturity in the skills and there's a lack of expertise uh, and experience in conducting the analysis and balancing tests necessary. So actually, I think there's a need for a whole professionalization of our sector, which is already happening and it will continue to happen. But, but there needs to be more dedicated data protection resources in organizations that after all are the ones that are accountable under the GDPR. But just to say a, a few words about prioritization from the point of view of my office, we keep our priorities consistently on fighting for more budget. We'll have over 200 staff at the DPC by the end of this year. So big contrast to the 30 you mentioned we had in 2014, but we need to keep that focus on hiring skilled staff. We need to focus on issuing clearer guidance and sectoral guidance, John Edwards, talks about making privacy easy. He's right. That's very important for us to do. And we need to support those new data protection officers as well in their roles. As I said earlier, they're the key. They're the ones in organisations that need to better transact with the public around how their personal data is being processed. We deal with a very high volume of complaints from individuals at my office, about 8,000 a year. As an authority, we need to get better at putting into practice the risk-based approach ourselves that the GDPR advocates, because not all complaints are equal. And of course, we need to conclude out more of those larger scale inquiries that we've underway. We've concluded some of them already. We've issued fines. But those well-reasoned decisions that we can output with our co-decision makers in the EU, they guide better. And of course, we want to also keep as a priority a focus on children so that we can build a better future in, in, in terms of where we've arrived at. So uh, absolutely big focus on resources uh, to deal with the volume we have. We need more and we need skilled resources, technology, legal staff of all different types. I sense a thread of empowering individuals, both within and without your your office, to know more and and um, bring it into the fabric of of what you're doing. That's interesting. Um, your office, along with the offices of everyone here today, represent the forefront of what data protection authority is capable of when given the resources, the independence, and the power to affect change in your your privacy ecosystem. As more and more fledgling authorities across the globe find their footing and begin building their educational, investigational, and, and enforcement priority list, what advice can you share for making the biggest impact as efficiently as possible? So I think in line with, with my comments from just a few moments ago, I would advise any new data protection authority to focus on specialist recruitment. While an awful lot of data protection is about common sense and we have that idea that, that everyone knows about data protection, um, I, I think our experience is that it is a particular area of expertise and does need specialism. The other thing I would say in line with John Edwards' comments is focus on guiding, publish case studies, empower and inspire confidence. None of us using the ex in post enforcement uh, tools that we have are going to catch up with fixing everything. And so ex ante approaches to empowering data subjects, but empowering and inspiring organizations to comply uh, are very effective in our experience. Great, great words. And um, 
wonderful advice and guidance for uh, a fledgling organization uh, getting started in this space as well. Um, so thank you for, thank you everybody. Um, let's turn now to the discussion portion. I will um, uh, ask uh, you to jump in and respond if you, uh, if you're so inclined. Um, first, as leaders in the data protection space, you are in part charged to make sure data subjects are empowered and retain control of their personal information without placing a burden on private enterprise when those same subjects are unable to reap the benefits of an interconnected world. Would a more centralized approach in the vein of the GDPR make your job easier or more difficult? And how does your job change if regional privacy regimes like CCPA kickstart a trend of their own? Who would like to weigh in? I may probably start saying that uh, uh, the job is, is different and the work is different and the challenges are different. Uh, but actually there is not uh, a big uh, change. This is not uh, a revolution. That's uh, uh, rather the bigger awareness that we have at the moment. Uh, and at the same time, the possibility to, uh, to, to reach more people that we, had, uh, that we so far reached. So sometimes uh, privacy was uh, kept as uh, one of the additional things uh, in the, uh, the different uh, jurisdictions. Uh, right now, this is in the front of the discussion. And we had the uh, example of that during the COVID-19 crisis, uh, when we found out that all the answers that we tried to give uh, to the uh, COVID crisis uh, were somehow looked through the lens of the privacy protection, finding that there was no general problem with the uh, additional uh, additional principles and additional uh, law that was uh, uh, that was uh, given by, by the European legislator, but rather there was a necessity to look at the challenges that we have uh, from more uh, more challenging and more global pro uh, point of view. Sammy, I think I, I, I might add to what Wojciech said and say that I agree the more global policy and regulatory connectivity we can have, the better the outcomes uh, are, are going to be. And I think particularly in, in, in this digital age, if we have clearer policy goals that are being pursued around new technologies, artificial intelligence, facial recognition, and a clearer idea of where we're going, uh, that assists organizations in, in complying and, and it assists regulation and protection of individuals. But I think in addition, I would add that uh, it, it's very clear from our perspective, and I think Wojciech has talked about this frequently before, that uh, clearer dots where they can be joined between consumer competition and media regulation uh, would assist as well, because it's very clear when you're regulating internet companies um, that th these areas overlap. So, so I think the policy discussions are important and clearer articulation of where we want to go. So if I may just uh, jump in and build off what uh, Commissioner Borowski as well as uh, Commissioner Dixon mentioned. I was still, I was very struck like you, Tammy, by the Commissioner's uh, visual imagery of uh, Poland is not the same as uh, Spain and it's not the same as Ireland. Um, I think the basic idea that data is global. Uh, I actually personally implore uh, that the, there are many jurisdictions that are coming up with their own data protection uh, regimes. Uh, I don't think that it is practical uh, that all regimes are centralized, just as there's no centralized code of law. Uh, it is a very difficult aim because the context and the, and the culture are all very different. But I think in practical experience, as I mentioned, even within a very, very diverse area like ASEAN, for example, actually we found that the basic principles have been rather consistent and there's far more common ground, even if the individual jurisdiction regimes may be slightly different, there's far more common ground that allows interoperability. And I think that remains the key, finding that common ground as far as interoperability as opposed to a more dominant view that, oh, there is a single uh, regime uh, to that. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, let's turn now to COVID-19. Um, we've touched on that, but I'd be very curious to um, understand if you sense 
uh, a difference in how individuals view their personal data now that we are um, a year into uh, the pandemic and the, the increased use of suddenly of using sensitive personal data for uh, in ways that we never would have imagined. Do you sense a change in uh, in individuals' attitudes in your jurisdictions or um, anything else that, that you can sense differently? We certainly have had that perception in Ireland and actually backed up by some empirical studies we've seen recently. We've seen that when the pandemic started, that the GDPR and the DPC were in prominence in a number of areas, including, as I said, in debates around COVID tracing apps, but also around how COVID test results were being communicated in, in, in workplaces. And we could see that there was a perception from the public that the law and the regulator were protective of them uh, and a very positive perception of it. Uh, because I think, you know, the media was fueling a lot of stories about government surveillance uh, and, and types of techniques that could be used to, to counter the pandemic. Uh, and the public were glad to see that there was a framework there and that the DPC was directing publication of data protection impacts assessments, source code for COVID tracing apps. Uh, and so on, and that's positive. I, what I see also is there's a little bit more of a reigniting of the debate around scientific and health research and uses of personal data in that. And I think it's positive that uh, the, the debate is active because perhaps now with the rapid development of vaccines, people are seeing a new balance in terms of uh, allowing the processing of some personal data for benefits on the other side. So it, it's active, the debate, and I think that's good. So I think, Tammy, your question, and just to build off what uh, Helm was mentioning, has something changed and switched permanently? I think the answer is most definitely. Uh, I think Helen has spoken quite a lot about uh, COVID tracing apps. Uh, I think our experience has also been that we need to be as transparent as possible and to show that uh, we are building trust uh, as far as consumer and personal data is concerned. And as she said, you know, even opening up the app for uh, ethical hackers to take it apart just to prove that uh, indeed uh, it is uh, what is advertised. But maybe if I were to say just going slightly beyond just uh, the field of uh, COVID apps itself, I think one of the surveys that we did was I think three in four uh, people are going to continue to maintain that elevated level of online shopping for example. So I think the, the impact of that permanent shift in the use of personal data, uh, I think is seen far more than just in uh, COVID apps. I think the fundamental behaviors of how people live, work and play has changed. And that means a lot more personal data is being collected and we must therefore ensure that we continue to keep on our toes, uh, provide that uh, trusted and uh, confidence uh, in the overall system. Uh, let me just add one sentence saying that yes, there are the things which change the, in the individual approach, but I think also what the public authorities realized uh, was that uh, the more transparent they are with what they do and uh, how they are dealing with the privacy of the people, the more trust they may expect from the people themselves. Those countries that gave a lot of information on what would they do with the personal data of the people. And I think Singapore is a very good example, by the way, uh, got uh, the very trusty response uh, uh, from the people who understood what's going on and, uh, uh, and at the same time shared the purpose to be achieved. So in addition to the ups and downs of regular privacy discourse, I'm sure you've all ha also had to contend with the way COVID-19 has impacted the lives of your constituents and the rapid response it requires. Commissioner Edwards, have people's relationships with their personal data fundamentally changed over the course of the past year? And do you see new developments in the privacy ecosystem as a result? Or do you think everyone is eager to go back to normal, whatever that may be? I think we've seen people actually engage with um, the, the sorts of trade-offs. Uh, people have said, well, you know, personal information is important to me. Uh, I want to be able to go to a bar and have a drink and not give my name to everybody there. Uh, but 
we also have a common duty to try and defeat this uh, pandemic. Uh, so people have said, all right, I understand that that has consequences for my personal information. But the trade-off is you can only use it for these public health purposes. Uh, and I think it's been you know, quite a positive thing to have people engaging and making those very deliberate uh, trade-offs and choices um, and demanding uh, greater levels of protection from the increased number of agencies that are um, aggregating their information. So there's been that. I think there is a desire for it to go back to normal as well. I mean, we have an, an obligation to scan uh, QR codes here, but we've seen as we've eliminated the virus, um, complacency creep in. So people not do that. And whether that's about protecting their privacy or whether it's just um, you know, human nature of laziness and complacency, I don't know. But um, I, I mean, I think all around the world, we're wanting to see some return to normality. Whether we're going to get that, uh, I really don't know. I mean, we've seen in some jurisdictions, the infrastructure of surveillance for COVID being transformed and co-opted into day-to-day -day business as usual. And I won't name jurisdictions, but we've seen these controversies uh, pop up around the world. And you know, I think there are risks there. Thank you, thank you all. The, the common theme that I'm pulling out of our discussion so far is transparency, balance and trust. Um, uh, very, very well noted. Um, we'll now move on to the question and answer portion. Um, we did um, encourage and solicit questions in advance of this recorded session. So thank you to all who sent questions in ahead of time. Um, so first question, in each of your jurisdictions, what separates a non-compliant organization that is genuinely trying to do better from a, from a non-compliant organization that isn't giving their privacy practices the necessary care and attention. Well, I can kick off on that one. <clears throat> Sorry, Tammy. I, I, I think what distinguishes those two types of scenarios for us is that you can have organizations that are very well resourced that in title have uh, the legal and data protection officer expertise, but they really uh, utilize those resources to find ways around uh, implementations of the GDPR that are most uh, privacy enhancing. Um, and then you can have an organization that really is conscious and trying, but they simply have not procured the correct level of resources and they often spend their time uh, looking for pre-packaged answers and thinking that there's a book or a website you can read the answer on instead of understanding. You do have to go back to first principles analysis uh, and look at the specific scenario and take the steps through. Um, so uh, often it's about application of, of the skilled resources and how that's done. Well, I'll just quickly add on. I completely agree with uh, everything that uh, Helen mentioned. Uh, obviously, that's adhering to just the letter of the law, uh, but there's a little bit more than that. It's really about how they apply the, the capabilities that the, the company has uh, in dealing with the situation at hand. I'm just going to add an added uh, perspective, which is it really comes to the fore when incidents actually happen. Uh, because how a company then responds and has to mitigate uh, when an incident really happens I think shows the real difference between what is really just a compliant organization and one that really takes it at its core of what they do as far as business. And we can see that dichotomy quite clearly in terms of how they respond to customer um, sort of concerns, how do they deal with that mitigation and the kind of capabilities that they put in place as far as forensics is concerned. So I think that's a key area in which we're trying to place emphasis as far as what companies do, both when it's sort of in preparation for as well as in the, in the unfortunate circumstances when the incident actually happens. And uh, I have to add something from a different point of view, since uh, my jurisdiction is only over the, uh, the public authorities, uh, over the data, uh, over the institutions, bodies and agencies of the European Union. Uh, I can say that these are public authorities have still to have still to remember that uh, of course, they are fighting with the pandemic and they try to uh, find the best ways to solve the uh, problems of the whole society. But at the same time, they serve the society. And the society are the human beings. It's not a mob. 
It's a, this is the combination on the collection of human, human beings who are in our, uh, in, in our society. Commissioner Edwards, large corporations with massive stores of personal data can often single-handedly change the data protection landscape with their decisions and practices. What's the next corporate spurred privacy debate you expect to land on your desk in 2021? Hmm. It's an interesting question. Um, these things tend to flare up uh, without much notice. Um, you know, new technologies and the retail availability of new technology, such as facial recognition, uh, pose significant um, challenges. But I think it is that um, it is that sort of retail availability that uh, that um, threatens privacy by putting these products in people's faces without necessarily the information to test whether they've been, you know, whether the algorithms are based on reliable data uh, or whether they are coding in bias or inaccurate for certain groups of the community. Um, I think transparency is going to continue to be a significant challenge to open the black box, to inform people what's happening with their data, to uh, inform people how artificial intelligences are trained in things. These are going to be the continued challenges uh, uh, to, to data protection and privacy. Uh, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I have a question about the World Bank. Um, given our mission, mandate, and purpose, and given that we intersect, intersect with each of your jurisdictions in our work around the world, um, what role do you see our organization or other international organizations playing in the privacy discussion? Um, as you know, we recently adopted our first privacy policy and we are rolling that out. It becomes effective in just a couple of days. Um, but going forward, what role do you see us playing and how can we um, be more involved in the, in the global discourse? I'm happy to say that uh, the organizations like World Bank uh, are the very good, uh, uh, very good uh, herald of what the privacy should be around the world. So for the countries that are quite new in this approach to the personal data protection, but also to cyber security, the World Bank can show what is the all, uh, all global standard. For those countries that feel themselves that they are very strong and they know everything about uh, cybersecurity and data protection again, uh, the World Bank serves uh, as the uh, platform when they can see that not all the uh, not all the cultures are the same, not all the countries are on the same level of the development, uh, while at the same time the world is one, and we have to work on all of them. Well, I think the World Bank as a global, if I call it brand, I think it's extremely well known. And in being that standard bearer of what is possible at a high level, cutting across different cultures, jurisdictions, uh, I think sets a very, very high bar. And uh, I think that's an important role that the World Bank has and continues to play. Commissioner Edwards. Other data protection authorities from other countries and other organizations, um, including ours, who may be watching right now and might lack funding or resources uh, to address data privacy issues. How can smaller authorities fulfill this mandate effectively while still remaining business and organization friendly? Um, it's a really important point, uh, we have a really supportive community of international data protection authorities. Uh, some are better funded than others, but the Global Privacy Assembly, which used to be known as the International Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners, um, that's, it's now the GPA. Uh, we pull together a lot of resources and support um, smaller data protection authorities. So we share uh, our online resources. All the stuff that we produce for my website, for example, is um, open source. So I'm happy to share the code for uh, our, our uh, FAQs and our um, online modules with anybody who wants them. Uh, of course, 
the, the laws differ in different jurisdictions, so they need to be tweaked. But um, I think uh, once you get close to our community, you'll see that it is very sort of mutually supportive and sharing of those kinds of resources. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you for your generosity. Um, uh, we will take you up on that at some point. Note to self. Um, you do have uh, a fantastic suite of resources available, both uh, to the general public and practitioners. It's, um, it's bookmarked on, on my laptop, for sure, um, along with a couple others um, that are also uh, extremely useful. But thank you so much for the resources and the generosity. One final question, um, and this goes to the privacy paradox, which we have been talking about here at the bank. Um, it's a controversial position that essentially says people's actions don't really reflect how much they claim to care about their privacy. Um, we can see this in using social media and in using Internet of Things products, etc. Um, what are your thoughts on the privacy paradox and why might early privacy research have come to this conclusion? I think, Tammy, in some way this relates back to the discussion we were having earlier about other forms of regulation that need to be in some way, if not integrated, have the dots joined with data protection regulation. Uh, because it's clear that if in the market you have very little choice, whether it's through network effects or lack of alternative services, um, then clearly uh, that that lack of choice is is not really a privacy paradox or, or a purporting to care, but then acting as if you don't. It, it's simply a matter of convenience. Users have to get on with living their lives and being social beings and communicating and interacting with others. Uh, and, and perhaps there's little choice about the tools that we use to do that. Um, so, um, I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure that this idea that people profess great concern about data protection, but act in an alternative way is really true. Um, I think their choices are constrained in, in a certain number of respects. The uh, COVID crisis has also learned us uh, that uh, allow, allowed us to learn that uh, we normally behave very strange as far as the epidemiological defense is concerned. So we don't wear, we didn't wear masks so far. And of course, there was a possibility to be infected. Now we can see that there are the ways to protect ourselves, but at the same time, that does not mean that we have to uh, that we have to separate from the other people. This is more or less what happened with the privacy. It started to be more observed, but it does not mean that we have to separate from the people. That we have to stay on our own island. We just have to be careful and know what are the dangers and how to fight with them. And uh, the fact, the mere fact that traffic is very dangerous for the people does not mean that I shouldn't drive car. It does not mean that I should not walk the streets. I just should know what are the rules, what are the expectations of the other participants of the traffic, and to be able to find out how to fight, how to fight with any kind of uh, um, harms that, uh, uh, that I'm endangered to. Bye. Uh, if I may just add on from a slightly more philosophical perspective, there is a brand new branch, well, not so new anymore, a branch of economics called behavioral economics, uh, whereby uh, individual actors don't necessarily act in the most rational uh, manner. So I just kind of use that as a footnote to say, uh, my view is that the jury is still out. Uh, I suspect that the answer may be a mix because there is, I kind of alluded to that, um, widespread understanding of data, data protection of personal data, what it actually means, what the social media actually collect. Uh, I think at this stage, even though consent is a key paradigm as far as all our data protection regimes is concerned, uh, what individuals actually consent to, uh, they may or may not uh, be fully aware uh, at this particular stage. So my view is that the jury is still out uh, I think as we educate consumers a lot more, I think we'll have a better sensing uh, of where that is. And I think it's a mix of both uh, individual power to choose, as well as the market power, as Helen mentioned, uh, to constrain as far as alternatives. And I think the answer is probably somewhere in between. 
very good, very good. Um, we now have the pleasure of turning to Ms. Meg Kinnear, Secretary General at ICSID for closing remarks. Meg, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us here today. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I would like to start today by thanking our distinguished speakers on this Data Privacy Commissioner's Roundtable. I think today's discussion makes clear the remarkable progress that's been made globally on data privacy. Uh, this is in no small part due to the leadership of the commissioners who joined us today and other of their counterparts around the world. Uh, your longstanding work and your expertise in this field, of course, have contributed to the progress that the World Bank Group has made as we've moved to implement our policy on personal data privacy. As head of one of the five organizations that comprises the World Bank, the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, we've worked alongside with IBRD, IFC, MEGA uh, in the development of this policy. Each of us, of course, faces unique issues and challenges given our respective clients and our different business models. But we found that we've all benefited enormously from approaching data privacy on a one World Bank group basis. Cooperation is critical here to ensuring implementation of the policy consistently and sustainably. I think today's roundtable certainly underlines the complexities involved in protecting personal data, as well as the speed at which emerging technology presents new challenges and opportunities. That part of the conversation especially resonated with me from an ICSID perspective, where we found that innovative technology has demonstrated an incredible potential to increase the efficiency, the transparency, and the accessibility of international dispute settlement, and in turn to support the international rule of law. But all of those benefits at the same time have raised some very difficult questions about the protection of personal data. And in our case, it's forced us to go back to basics and to look at our case rules, our internal practices, and the arrangements we have with technology and service providers to ensure that we can protect personal data. We've also taken part in the broader professional dialogue on data privacy and international arbitration. And I can assure you that at the very least, all of this is a brave new world for us. So hearing comments from people with your expertise is especially helpful. So I would like to thank you so much for your expertise, for you who are leading in this field, which is both a remarkably complex and uh, diverse field and one where we appreciate your pioneering work. We were delighted to hear your thoughts on the challenges and how to try and balance the competing needs and how to try and develop consensus and work to develop legal frameworks in data privacy. Finally, I'd like to thank Tammy and her team from across the World Bank Group who've organized this series of events for International Data Privacy Day. I'd like to wish you a very happy and successful International Data Privacy Day and to turn the uh, microphone over to Tammy for the wrap up of today's events. Thank you. Well, this has been a fantastic discussion. Um, I know I could uh, spend much more time um, speaking with, with each of our distinguished panelists. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you to those who sent in questions and participated today. Uh, thank you to our, our esteemed commissioners for their insight, your insight and advice. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the event. Um, please join us for the rest of World Bank Group Data Privacy Day. Coming up next is a round table by our colleagues at the IFC and MEGA with several leading speakers from the private sector. I'm looking forward to seeing you all there. Until then, thank you very much and we'll see you soon.